Dear friends, the internal maneuvers associated with vitrectomy have, have developed so much an extent over the last 20 years that external maneuvers have become somewhat of the poor relation of retinal surgery to the point that in some countries they are no longer taught to novice surgeons. However, they deserve to be talked about since the EVRS RD study recommends them very strongly in the majority of detachment primary procedure. Let's start with the cryotherapy. There is not much to say about it. Its goal is to create an inflammatory reaction that turns into an adhesive reaction. In the past, cryotherapy had the, best, the bad reputation of stimulating or even causing postoperative PVR. Indeed, since it was made without microscopic control, it was most of the time overdosed. Today, and the surprising result of the RD study have confirmed it, it even give better results than the transpapillary laser photoregulation. There is more to say about the external drainage of the subretinal fluid. This maneuver is not very popular because of its compli complications, mainly because of the risk of retinal incarceration and the risk of hemorrhage. We will see later when we talk about technique how these complications can easily be avoided. The fact remains that even the highest opponents to external drainage practiced it from time to time as so many of its benefits are inescapable. What are the role of this drainage? There are several of them. When making an indentation in front of a tear, reducing the amount of subretinal fluid will reduce the height of the indentation needed to obtain contact with the tear. The drainage will act as a low tide that are flush with the water surface at high tide. It therefore reduces the trauma of indentation. The second role of the drainage offer superimposed of that of tamponade is to make the retinal fold disappear. As the subretinal fluid disappear, each millimeter of retina will spread out to match its original location and the folds will disappear. If a gas injection is made, it will not mark this fold like an iron on a pleated tablecloth. This avoids the risk of retinal folds of the posterior pole, which sometimes occur after the injection of a steel, on a steel detached retina. With complete prior drainage, there is, this is not possible. Each square millimeter of retina will have returned to its place. Here is an example. A radial buckle has been placed on the top of a chair by traction, but despite this, there is a small retinal fold that connects the subretinal space with the vitreous cavity. Before the gas was introduced, this fold was a cause of failure, even if the indentation was strong enough to release the vitreous traction. A drainage is performed and air is injected to maintain the pressure. The control with the prismatic lens shows that, although not yet air buffered, 
the radial fold has disappeared perfectly and that the tear is well spread over the indentation. The third role of the drainage is simply to remove the subretinal fluid. This has three advantages. First of all, it allows to extract from the eye a liquid rich in proteins, in growth factors, especially RPGF, and also in pigment. Second, this immediately restores the pigment epithelium to its pump role. By putting the retina flap, the need for strict positioning is therefore less important. And in doing so, it is quite useful in practice terms when the patient is checked the next day. If on the operating table you put the retina flat, the next day during the control it must be flat. If not, you have forgotten a tear. So you will tell me the opposite. If I leave some liquid in perop and the next day I see that the retina is flat, I'm sure I have healed it. And I would answer yes, except for the old detachment where the liquid resorbs more slowly. If there is liquid left, then what do you do? You have to call the patient back a few days later to verify that the liquid has gone. The fourth role of the drainage, and not the least, is to release an available volume. Available to perform a buckle. Know that when uh, we make a buckling without centripetal force, that is to say, without using the elasticity of the material, we need 0.2 to 0.3 cc's per quadrant for a normal indentation and 0.4 cc per quadrant for indentation plus fold. Available to inject a gas bubble and or to perform a buckling plus a gas injection. So you see a lot of advantage. We will see in another chapter how to make this drainage safe and effective and you will not be able to do without it. Let's see now the gas injection. The roles of gas injection are simpler to understand and involve two phenomena. The first is minor and only concerns expensive gases. It is the maintenance of high pressure. This role seems interesting the day after SF6 injection, which means during the gas expansion phase. I measured the blood across barrier breakdown with a laser sulfurimeter in phacic detachment by trophic hole, stage zero, with normal pressure that had either an indentation or an indentation plus gas injection. There is a difference in favor of gases, of uh, cases where the gas was injected. The same could be observed after epiretal membrane surgery. I don't know if this has an impact. However, I do take issue with a fairly common assertion that injection of gas is inflammatory. For both stage zero detachment and epiretinal membrane, the number of inflammatory cells is lower when gas is, in, is injected. In fact, this assertion comes from the fact that uh, when there is gas, the vitreous is compressed, concentrated, and appears rich richer in cells, but the number of cells is the same after re-expansion. The second wall of the gas uses what is called the buoyancy force. Since the gas bubble has, 
has no weight. There are only two forces in the water which affect it. The pressure of the water on its upper surface, which tends to bring it down, and the pressure on, of the water on its lower surface, which tends to make it go up. The bubble raises because the force on its underside is greater and the result is called the buoyancy force. This force is equal to the pressure of a column of water, the height of the bubble. By pressing on the, water, on the retina, this gas bubble will have two effects. It will push back the fold like an iron on a tablecloth on the condition of pushing them back from the posterior pole toward the periphery, condition that disappears if a preliminary drainage has been done, but it will also plug the descents all the more easily since it will dry it, unlike a silicon bubble. Moreover, the effectiveness of the silicon bubble is further reduced by the fact that normal silicone has a weight of 0.9 and therefore the buoyancy force 10 times lower than that of a gas. The descents being closed, the epithelium pump will be able to act in full efficiency. The gas has often been blamed for creating inferior tears. This may be true when there is a contraction of vitreous base marked by a circumferential retinal fold. And the vitreous pancase has not been released by an indentation. If the vitreous pancake is released, the gas bubble cannot cause inferior tears. At the most, it will precipitate the PVD formation and cause a tear to appear if it were to appear. These rules of plugging the essence and erasing the folds are considered considerable and to make you feel this important, I will tell you an anecdote. When I left Miribonnet service in Lyon in 1982, we had just come to start injecting gas. Before gas, Madame Bonnet had among the best global statistics in detachment in the world. 13% failure in retinal detachment primary procedure stage 0, A, B, C1, and maybe a, a few C2. In a simple detachment, what was the problem? It was necessary to plug the day senses, thanks to the indentation, without creating a fish mouse, this small fold resulting from the tear which makes the vitreous cavity communicate with the subretinal space. It is to fight against this fish mouth that we made intrascleral pockets that we stuffed with fascia lata after dissecting the vorticus vein. You see the work. I started my private, private activity in 82 and immediately I systematically injected gas as we have just started in Lyon. And my statistics immediately dropped to between 3 and 4% failure for the same stages. That means four times less failure thanks to the gas and these two walls to plug the descents and erase the folds. Remember this anecdote when you wonder if it's worth injecting gas. And now let's finish with the indentation. Its walls are much more complex than it is usually admitted to recognize. The first wall is the simple obturation of the descents, which will allow the retinal reapplication thanks to the action of the epithelium 
bump if no traction or retraction prevents it. It is the very first rule of indentation, the most unanimously recognized, even if it is not, in my opinion, the most important one. According to Ron Michaels, a well-placed but insufficient indentation without perfect contact with the essence still hinders the entry of intravitreal fluid. Moreover, the movement of the globe and the, and the indentation favor the exit of the subretinal fluids, which means that, at the end, the retinal reapplication will still be obtained. For my part, in these very simple cases where failure is not admissible, each time the intraoperative control shows that the dehiscence is not perfectly out of water, I prefer to practice for drainage of the subretinal fluid in the interverticus vein raffae and even add an injection of gas bubble for greater safety. The second role of indentation is the relaxation of vitreous traction. This is for me its most important role. In case of dynamic traction, and if vitrectomy is not recommended by the specific clinical case, there will be no other way to plug the tear. A gas injection would oppose the force of vitreous traction of these two antagonist forces, only two situations can occur. Either the retina rips under the effect of the gas pressure and there will be an increase of the retinal tear, or the retina resists and the gas will be unable to press it against the pigment epithelium. We must therefore make an indentation to release this tractional element. And this relaxation is not a view in mind. You can see in this example that the indentation releases the traction as we released an elastic. At three weeks, we see the relaxation of the traction and the movement of the retinal flap. Same thing for static traction on the base of the vitreous. Remember this example presented in the first chapter. The buckling releases the, track, the static traction and here also this relaxation is not a view of the mind. We can see after three weeks this relaxation in the form of a vitreous elbow. The third wall is the relaxation of the vitreous base. When there is a beginning of contraction of the vitreous base, marked by the appearance of the small circumferential retinal fold, the indentation will compensate for the vitreous contraction by bringing the pigment epithelium against the vitreous pancake and the adjacent retina. And one thing must be understood. It is that by pushing back this vitreous pancake, by exerting on it a centripetal force, even in a single quadrant, this indentation will relax the contraction on 360 degrees on all the periphery and the pancake. This is good to know. In the case of a sclerosmalacia, prohibiting a scleral work in regard, the realization of an indentation in a quadrant free from scleral damage will have the same action of relaxation of the base. Please note, if the integrity of the vitreous pancake has been interrupted by a vitrectomy, the role of relaxation over 360 degrees will no longer be as effective because the centripetal forces will no longer be transmitted by the central pancake. 
This is why, in these cases of significant contraction of the vitreous base, having justified a vitrectomy, it will be preferable to perform a free 160 degrees buckling. We see postoperatively the small vitreous ring spread over the buckle. The fourth wall is the reversal of preretinal retraction forces. The contraction of an epiretinal membrane exerts a shortening force on the retina which results in a force away from the pigment epithelium which has a concave surface. A strong indentation going beyond the rest position of the contracted retina will reverse the forces actively clamping the retina and stabilizing the, reti the retraction process. This wall is evident in the full thickness retinal folds, but it is also useful in stage B, where, as we have seen, a haloid plaque is located just behind the tear and will give rise to a start of membrane. For this to happen, the indentation will need to be preeminent enough. The fifth and last role of indentation is the possibility of adding a scleral shortening. As we have seen, the retraction causes a reduction in the retinal surface. At a maximum of its contraction, the retina will be stretched like a string of a bow, forming a rigid V. The difference in length between the retina and the corresponding pigment epithelium, in this worst case scenario ever achievable in practice, will be 16 hundredth of radius or 1.7 millimeters only. A scleral shortening of this length would make it possible to compensate precisely for this retinal contraction. Of course, in practice, this contraction will be dissected to give flexibility to the retina, but there are cases where, even by removing all the peritoneal and subretinal retractions, whether anterior or posterior, the retina keeps a certain rigidity linked to an intraretinal fibrosis. In these cases, performing a cerclage associated with a scleral shortening will be a less traumatic alternative than a retinotomy or retinectomy and silicone injection. We will see how to achieve what we call an indentation plus four. Here you are, you know the words of uh, these external maneuvers. Now let's see how to make all of this will work without causing too much complication. That is to say, how to perform these external maneuvers. So now, let's go to surgery. <laughs>